Well, good evening. Thank you for joining us again tonight as we continue our series, Characters at the Cross. We're thinking of people who were present when the Lord Jesus was crucified and what it meant for them, the different experiences that they had. Tonight, we're going to think about a man called Simon the Cyrenian or Simon of Cyrene. And it may seem uh, as you read the incident uh, involving Simon that this is just a kind of chance encounter uh, that Simon has with the Lord Jesus. But we're going to see, I think, although very little is told us about his earlier life or his later life, but I think we're going to see that this incident had a dramatic impact upon him. He's mentioned in three out of the four Gospels, and yet each Gospel just gives him one verse, just one very brief mention. We're going to read it in Mark's Gospel, chapter 15. Mark chapter 15, first of all, verse 20 says, when they had mocked Jesus, they took the purple robe off him and put his own clothes on him and led him out to crucify him. Then they compelled a certain man, Simon, a Cyrenian, the father of Alexander and Rufus, as he was coming out of the country and passing by to bear his cross. And they brought him to the place Golgotha, which is translated the place of a skull. Amen. At this point, the Lord Jesus is treading what some people call the Via Dolorosa, the way of sorrow, the path from the judgment hall to the place of the skull, the place of execution. He has been accused, he has been charged, he has been condemned, he has been scourged, he has been beaten, and now he is carrying his cross out to Golgotha, out to Calvary. I believe this was the normal procedure for someone who was condemned to be crucified. It was an added indignity that they were expected to carry their very instrument of torture out to the place of execution. And so we find uh, the Lord Jesus is carrying his cross. Now, at some point, the soldiers think he's not going to make it. Now, let me just be very clear. I don't think for a minute there was any doubt that the Lord Jesus would make it. There is no way that the Lord Jesus would not have made it to Calvary carrying his cross. But the soldiers are thinking. They're thinking, possibly in their minds, they're saying he, he's going to die before he reaches there. His, his treatment has been so severe. He's been so badly treated that carrying his cross might just be the final push and he might die before he reaches Calvary. No, they're not doing this out of pity. They're not thinking this out of some feeling of sympathy. They're doing it because they don't want him to miss the cross. They don't want to spare him the horrors of crucifixion. They don't want him to cheat crucifixion. And so they want him to survive in their minds. They want him to survive until he gets to the cross and, and to be able to crucify him. And as I say, I don't believe for a minute that anything else would have happened. The Lord Jesus was definitely going to die at Calvary. We believe that 100%. But they thought, I think they thought that perhaps he wouldn't make it. And so they look around the crowd and they spot Simon. And they drag Simon out of the crowd. And Simon of Cyrene, a comparative stranger it would seem, somebody as far as we know had never set eyes on the Savior before, had never been involved in anything that was happening. His name is never mentioned before this. And yet now suddenly he is propelled reluctantly into the spotlight. Well, tradition holds that Simon was a black man. Now, he did come from Cyrene, which is in North Africa, so that's a possibility, but I'm not sure if that's the case. Some suggest that maybe that was why the soldiers picked on him, because he stood out in the crowd as being a man from Africa. Uh, it may be. Others believe that Simon was a Jew who was living in Cyrene and just happened, as it were, by chance to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. Whatever the explanation is, I'm quite certain of this, that this is a task that Simon would never have volunteered to do. And he is being forced. The Bible says they compel him. 
the Romans as the occupying power in Palestine, they had the authority to compel the native inhabitants of the country to carry their burdens for them. And so they are exercising this right and they're, they're grabbing hold of this man, Simon of Cyrene, and they're forcing him, they're compelling him to bear the cross. Dear friends, there may be circumstances in our lives that force us to do things that we don't want to do. I'm sure Simon wanted to be anywhere but here. He wanted to do anything but this. And he's forced into this situation. And yet this is the very means by which God brings him in contact with the Lord Jesus. You know, there are situations in our lives, there are circumstances in our lives that we would rather avoid. We've been forced into it. It seems as though we've been compelled to, to, to take a certain course of action. And yet it may well be that God has allowed that so that we will come into contact with Christ. And so really against his will, totally reluctantly, I believe, he, he picks up his cross. He picks up the Lord Jesus, his cross, and he begins to carry the cross. Just one other point before we get to the incident. We haven't got to the incident itself yet, but just one other point before we get there. Mark tells us that Simon was the father of Alexander and Rufus. Now, why would he say that? Why would he tell us that? Well, the reason is this, that Mark assumes that most of his readers will know who Alexander and Rufus are. Because we learn later on when we read Paul's letters in the New Testament, that he refers to Alexander and Rufus as Christians who are well known in the Christian community. And it seems to me that not only as a result of this incident has it had a dramatic impact on Simon's life, uh, so severe and so dramatic has this been that it had an impact on his family. And it seems to me that his family became Christians. They're well known. And so Mark says, you know this man, or you know of him, because he is the father of Alexander and Rufus. And these men were well known as Christians later on. And so I think we can see that this incident, and we're going to look at it in a moment just briefly, but this incident had a big impact, not just on Simon of Cyrene, but on his family as well. Let's just look briefly at the incident itself. Now, this was a life, I believe it was a life-changing encounter. And I want to just point out three very uh, simple changes that took place immediately. Uh, as soon as this incident uh, developed, there were three great changes as far as Simon was concerned. First of all, there was a change of direction. I heard someone just last week on the radio saying, I did a 180, a 180. It took me a while to work out what he meant. What he meant was that he had turned around 180 degrees. He'd completely changed direction. He changed his attitude, his thinking about something. And he said, I did a 180. Well, dear friends, Simon of Cyrene did a 180. He was coming out of the country. He was coming into the city. The Lord Jesus is leaving the city. They're heading in the opposite directions. And he's facing, uh, no, he's, he's turning right round. He's, he's turning 180 degrees and he's completely changing his direction. He's going in a different way altogether. Dear friends, that's exactly what conversion is. It's a change of direction. It's a turning around. It's doing a 180. It's turning around and going in the opposite way and facing the opposite direction. It's a change of mind. It's a change of attitude. And so and the Bible tells us that as we are by nature, we're facing in the wrong direction. We're heading toward ruin. We're heading towards judgment because of our sins. We're going away from God. We're going towards eternal judgment. And if we're going to be saved and we're going to be blessed and we're going to be in heaven one day, we're going to have to change direction. We're going to have to turn around. And so Paul writes later on, to Christians at Thessalonica, and he says, you turned to God from idols. They were once facing a completely different direction, but when they heard the gospel message, they turned around. That's what conversion really is. Dear friends, I want to ask you, have you done a 180? Have you turned around? Have you been converted? Have you changed your mind completely? That's really what conversion and repentance really means. It's a willingness 
to admit that I've been heading in the wrong direction, I've been going the wrong way, and I need to be willing to turn around and to change completely for my life to be changed. I wonder if you're willing to do that. And very literally, that is just what Simon did. He was heading in one direction, and suddenly, as a result of this intervention, as a result of this encounter with Christ, he's turned around and he's headed the opposite way. You know, there are lives, and there are people perhaps listening to this, and your life has been dramatically changed. You've been heading in one direction. Your life and your interests and all your ambitions have been in one direction. And then suddenly you've met the Savior, and you've been saved, and you've been converted, and you've been turned around. And just like Simon, it was a great change of direction. It was a change, secondly, in occupation. Here was Simon doing something he'd never done before. I'll guarantee he'd never helped to carry a, a condemned a criminal's cross, as he would think at this stage at least. He'd never been, he'd been asked to do this before. And here he is. Uh, he is now taking up the cross and he is carrying it after Jesus. Now, that was a big thing to do. Simon wasn't wearing the cross as some kind of piece of jewelry or as some kind of ornament. The, the cross, to, to be associated in any way with the cross and with crucifixion was a horrific thing. Crucifixion was so dreadful and so terrible that no Roman, be he a, a multiple killer, be a serial murderer, be a child molester, be he whatever the worst, the most heinous crime you could imagine, no Roman citizen could ever be crucified because it was deemed so shameful and so dreadful and so painful. And we little realize in our society just the horror with which people regarded the cross and crucifixion. And so Simon is being asked and has been forced to, to take something into his hands. He doesn't, we sing about the old rugged cross uh, as an object of affection. It was an object of shame and reproach. And Simon, I can imagine with sinking heart, he is now picking up something that is so horrific and dreadful and shameful. And he is in a certain way, he is now carrying the cross and he's sharing in the reproach of Christ. You know, Paul wrote once, God forbid that I should boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. For first century people, people living in Palestine in the Middle East, the cross was a symbol of shame and it was something that was scandalous, it was dreadful. And yet Paul says, now all my boast and all my glory is in the cross. And here is Simon. It's a change not only of direction, it's a change of occupation. He's now carrying the cross behind Jesus. Dear friend, the Lord Jesus spoke, didn't he, about his disciples taking up the cross and following him. In other words, in order to be a Christian, it's going to link you very, very closely to reproach and shame and suffering. I find it absolutely amazing that in countries today where becoming a Christian will involve persecution and it will involve real loss and hardship, it seems that in these countries, many people are, are picking up the cross, as it were, and, and they're becoming believers in the Lord Jesus, despite the cost. And yet, in our degenerate Western society, where the worst that we can face possibly is a sneer or a laugh, People are unwilling to pick up the cross. Simon was compelled to do this. I'll tell you this, I think for the rest of his life, he was eternally grateful that he got his hands on this cross and was able to have a change of occupation. He is now bearing the cross. He is following Christ. And thirdly, not only a change in direction and a change in occupation, but a change in identification. Because literally, he is now following Christ. He has become a literal follower of Christ. I'm not sure how this worked. If the Lord Jesus held the front of the cross and, and Simon held the, the, the rear, or, or, or whether Simon carried the whole thing, I don't know. But the Bible specifically says that he followed, that he carried the cross after Jesus. He, he literally followed Jesus. Well, I believe, dear friends, that what he did literally he soon did spiritually and 
actually he became a follower of Christ and I see that procession wending its way out to Golgotha the place of the skull and Simon is carrying the cross what's going through his mind as he looks at the figure in front of him with his with his crown of thorns and treated as he is and we don't know if a word was ever exchanged we don't even know if a look was exchanged the Lord Jesus knew everything about Simon Simon's carrying the cross. I'll tell you this, I think the angels in heaven were envying him at that point. Simon's carrying the cross, and what was the greatest shame is now turning out to be the greatest glory, and he is following the Lord Jesus. Well, I can imagine Simon as they come to Golgotha, and the soldiers take over, and he stands there, and he watches what happens, and he watches the Lord Jesus being stripped of his clothing and nailed to the cross and lifted up, and I can guarantee this, Simon hasn't a clue what's happening. He doesn't know what's going on. He doesn't understand what's happening. But I can imagine him thinking this. I don't know what this means, but I'm going to find out. And I can imagine Simon talking to some of the disciples later, perhaps even witnessing, seeing the Lord Jesus when he rose from the dead. And Simon, now he's coming to understand the meaning of the cross. That that man who died on the cross was bearing my sins, was paying the price for my salvation. And Simon, I believe, became a believer. He became a real, spiritual, actual follower of the Lord Jesus. He put his trust in him. And not only did it affect him, it affected his family. Dear friend, as we close tonight, have you had an encounter with Christ? Not as dramatic as this. You're never literally going to carry his cross. But nevertheless, he's asking you to do a 180, to turn around, to have a change of heart about your, about your life, about your sin, to, 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 to change your direction. And, and he's, he's asking you to, to change your occupation, to take up the cross, to be willing to stand with Christ and to believe in him. He's asking you to be a follower of the Lord Jesus as Simon became. He's asking you to change your life altogether. He will change your life altogether if you're willing to trust him to be your savior. And that's, I believe, exactly what Simon did and his sons, Alexander and Rufus. Perhaps I'm speaking to somebody tonight and your father or your mother is a Christian. And maybe there are people here listening and you've been brought up in a Christian home. I'll tell you this, you are one of the most privileged individuals in the entire universe. To be brought up in a Christian home, to know that your parents know the Savior, to know that they've trusted Christ and to hear them pray and, and to know the gospel message, you are privileged. And these men, Alexander and Rufus, they make their father's savior, their savior too. Have you done that? Well, tonight as we close in prayer, we're, we're drawing near to the cross. We're, we're, we reach now Golgotha, the place of the skull. The Lord Jesus is about to be crucified. And as he dies there, he's dying for our sins, the Bible says. He's dying to take our sins away. And, and, and he's going to rise from the dead. And because he has been raised from the dead, he's able to save all who come to him and trust in him and repent of their sins and believe in him. Are you going to do that? If you do that, it will be a life-changing encounter with Christ. Let's pray. Father, we give thanks for those individuals who came to the cross, some unwillingly, some almost by chance or by accident, it seems. And yet we think of how that what they saw, what they witnessed, what they were involved with changed their lives. We pray that somebody listening to this message may realize that they're going in the wrong direction, they're facing the wrong way, and they need a savior who can take their sins away. They need to turn to him. And we pray that somebody may do that tonight. We pray for thy blessing in the Lord's name. Amen.